Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming today. You are the uh, you are the uh, intrepid ones that braved the weather. Thank you for the weather did not uh, cooperate, but we're grateful that you uh, braved the weather and uh, are here with us this afternoon. Uh, I'm grateful to welcome you all. My name is Spencer Fluman. I am the executive director of the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship here at BYU. And uh, we are thrilled to have you here for this uh, significant guest lecture today. I'll introduce our speaker in a moment. But before that, um, events like this at BYU uh, always begin with prayer. So we're, uh, we're grateful to begin that way today. Uh, our opening prayer will be given by Dr. Tonalyn Rutherford. Um, she is an adjunct professor in church history and doctrine here at BYU. Thank you, Dr. Rutherford. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for the opportunity to listen today to this important scholar, and we're grateful for the opportunity to discuss this important topic. We pray that thou will be with our speaker, that thou will be with us to receive her words and her message, that we can all gain greater understanding and uh, be edified by this experience. We thank thee for the blessings of this beautiful earth and pray for those who are traveling in this weather that they will be protected and we're grateful for the moisture that we're receiving and grateful for the wonderful blessings that are afforded us here at Brigham Young University and we again ask for thy spirit to be with us and we do so in the name of Jesus Christ amen, amen. Uh, to introduce Dr. Winger, I'm going to start with the personal and then go to the professional because uh, Dr. Winger and I go back about a dozen years and um, she is a remarkable scholar. I'll say something about that in a, in a minute, but she's a remarkable human being too. Uh, generous and uh, a, a colleague that quite quickly became a good friend. So I am very grateful to introduce Dr. Tisa Winger. She's an associate professor of American Religious History at the Divinity School uh, at Yale University, but has appointments as well in American Studies and Religious Studies. She's been teaching for almost a decade there uh, in Connecticut. Her work explores the cultural politics of religious freedom, the religious histories of the American West, and the intersections of race, empire, and religion in U.S. history. Her first book was We Have a Religion, the 1920s Pueblo Indian Dance Controversy in American Religious Freedom, published in 2009 by the University of North Carolina Press, where all significant scholarship <laughs> appears. Amen. Right on. Her second book, uh, Religious Freedom, The Contested History of an American Ideal, was published by UNC Press as well in 2017, and she'll be addressing that topic today. Um, her next project uh, sounds spectacular. I heard the elevator pitch version of it um, the other day when I was showing Dr. Wang around campus and cannot wait uh, uh, for that project as well. Um, she lives in Hamden, Connecticut with her husband Rod Groff and their three children, along with a dog, two cats, a rabbit, five chickens, ten fish, <laughs> and a sizable vegetable garden. I'm glad you threw that all in there. It's very good. Um, her talk today is Religious Freedom, the Contested History of an American Ideal, and she's generously uh, agreed that after her talk, she'll she's willing to take uh, questions from the audience as well for the time that, any time that's remaining. So join me in welcoming Dr. Wenger here to BYU. Thanks so much for that introduction. Um, Spencer, it's so good to be here and see Dr. Fluman in his home territory, finally. <laughs> um, it's my first time being here at BYU, and I feel like I should have visited long, long ago. And I'm grateful to Dr. Fluman and the Maxwell Institute for this invitation. Um, I've been interested in Mormon history for quite some time, and especially 
since I taught at Arizona State University in Tempe, where I had a lot of Mormon students. And working with LDS students, I actually noticed some cultural similarities with my own Mennonite heritage. Um, both Mennonites and Mormons built their identities on a history of persecution and then became what Mennonites call the quiet in the land. Um, <laughs> really known for their industriousness, their big families, and for being super nice people, sometimes to a fault. Um, <laughs> but uh, um, there's something there, I think. So I um, have been here all week and am spending the whole week here doing research for my next book, which Dr. Fluman mentioned. Uh, and I'm envisioning this book as the, this next book as thinking about how settler colonialism shaped American religion in the early 19th century Midwest. So Mormon history enters into that in the kind of eight, especially 1830s and 1840s Missouri and Illinois period. Um, so I told Dr. Fluman a few minutes ago, this talk is something of a mashup and I'm a little nervous about it. It's kind of experimental because what I'm doing is pulling a little bit of that new research into conversation with my book on religious freedom. And you might think that religious freedom doesn't have anything to do with settler colonialism or American imperialism, but you would be wrong. And I'm uh, hoping to convince you of that. But um, it, it's also my first time really talking publicly about Mormon history, and that makes me nervous to do in front of a Mormon audience. Um, so <laughs> you have to tell me where I get it wrong. So first, a little bit about the book, Religious Freedom. And the talk title I recognize is a kind of generic one. And this is the title of the book. Um, and if you came expecting to hear about contemporary politics of religious freedom, you're going to be disappointed. But I hope you'll stick with me anyway. Um, I started work on this book with a series of unconventional questions about the history of this all-American ideal. What kinds of cultural and political work did religious freedom do in American history? How did diverse groups of people invoke this freedom? And what frameworks of religion did it impose on them? I didn't want to talk about what religious freedom is or how we should define it, but instead about what it does or what it did historically, how it has shaped communal identities in and beyond the United States for all sorts of people, but especially for racial and religious minorities and those colonized by the United States and what happens when people make appeals in its name. And I pretty much focused on the 1890s up through World War II. And partly because of that periodization, um, Mormons didn't enter into the book much. They certainly could have, because they certainly talked about religious freedom at that period as well. But the big Mormon religious freedom controversies right, were earlier. Um, maybe surprisingly to some of you, race and empire soon emerged as key themes in my analysis. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, leading Americans linked religious, racial whiteness, Protestant Christianity, and American national identity not only to freedom in general, but often to this freedom in particular. The most frequent and visible articulations of religious freedom, which I call religious freedom talk, were exclusive and coercive. They worked more often than not to privilege the dominant white Christian population. Much the same is true today, I would say, but that's a topic for another day. Um, this kind of religious freedom talk helped make the case for US colonial rule, first over Native Americans on Indian reservations, and then over the people of the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and other territories colonized by the United States. I could throw Hawaii in there as well. But racial and religious minorities, colonial subjects, also claimed this freedom and used it to defend their communities and their traditions. For Filipinos in, under US rule, who I write about in the book, for Native Americans, African Americans, and American Jews, religious freedom provided a way to redefine communal identities and to resist the classification of despised racial or colonial inferiors. 
through the language of religious freedom in a culture that so highly valued this freedom, oppressed peoples could claim their full humanity by naming themselves as religious subjects. It helped them carve out communal spaces in a hostile environment and however imperfectly to resist the constraints of racism and colonial rule. It also changed them and their traditions in a variety of ways. So how do Mormons fit into this story? Um, in honor of this invitation from the Maxwell Institute, I made the dubious decision to um, think about what that would have looked like had Mormons been part of the book. Um, the two places where Mormons do make an appearance, um, sort of a cameo appearance in my story, um, are number one, in a controversy over polygamy in the newly colonized Philippines in 1899, and number two, in debates over religious freedom for Native Americans. Um, gave me some, I think, important clues. Both, and I'll talk more about both of those cases at the very end of my talk. Both examples help us see how American religious freedom could work both for and against Mormons, and how religious freedom ultimately helped Latter-day Saints navigate racial and religious hierarchies in America. In the mid-19th century, the dominant white Protestant politics of religious freedom helped push Mormons outside the bounds of racial, religious, and national legitimacy in the United States as far as other Americans were concerned. The same time from the beginning, the Latter-day Saints claimed religious freedom as their own. In so doing, they identified themselves as the quintessential Americans at the center of the American story. After the fight over polygamy ended, their ongoing commitment to this ideal would help game Mormons mainstream acceptance as a wholesome all-American religion. In the meantime, the imperatives of religious freedom, I think, helped shape the church and its people. Um, I haven't been able yet to kind of fill that argument in in any detailed way, but I'm hoping that you can help me with that. Um, so as I said, like the Mormons, Lots of groups of people across the United States and across its imperial possessions invoked this idea to defend their own traditions and communities. So before we get to the Mormon story, I want to give a few examples of how this worked for, for particularly for Native Americans, um, who at the, in the 19th and for most of the 20th century had very little reason to expect that the idea of religious freedom would work for them. Native languages, first of all, like many others around the world, have no word that directly translates as religion. A wide variety of indigenous institutions, practices, and traditions that have come to be described as Native American religion are traditionally integrated into Native American life rather than being separated out as a unified system in this way. Um, for another thing, U.S. government officials made it abundantly clear that they did not consider Native traditions religion, at least in the sense protected by the First Amendment. They were far more likely to decry the, quote, savage tyranny that supposedly kept Indians enslaved and to present Christianity as the means to spiritual freedom. Nevertheless, almost as soon as Native Americans were forced to accept U.S. rule, they insisted that their practices and traditions were religious and must be granted the same rights and freedoms that other religions enjoyed. This, um, in a different way, is actually the subject of my first book, We Have a Religion, right? Native people claiming religion for themselves at the, and, the, and the kind of constitutional right for religious freedom. Religious freedom served Native Americans as an important strategic tool. If they could convince government officials that their practices merited this protection, they had a means of defense that white Americans might actually accept. But to pull this off, they had to remold their practices to fit the dominant kind of mold for what counted as religion. Often this meant making them, their traditions look more like Christianity or even subordinating them to Christianity entirely. This worked best um, for some of the newer pan-Indian movements that swept across Indian country in this period, such as the Shaker religion of the Pacific Northwest, um, 
and the more widespread peyote religion of the plains and intermountain west, which despite the longstanding bans on peyote use gained many allies and a degree of standing, of legal standing as the Native American church. Uh, another example, I'll give you a more specific kind of textured example from the Ojibwe people of the Red Lake Reservation in Minnesota, who sent a series of letters in 1916 and 1917 to protest the prohibition of their Midewiwin ceremonies. The, their BIA agent, Bureau of Indian Affairs, the federal agent, at the time called for a complete ban on what he called a so-called religious ceremony on the grounds that it was broadly detrimental to their progress as a people. The Ojibwe responded by demanding religious freedom. And to make the case that the Midewiwin was religion, they stressed the parallels they saw with Christian worship. The beating of the drum is simply an accompaniment to the songs of praise uttered by the congregation, they wrote. Just as in every church of the white man, a piano or an organ is found for the same purpose. This dance is one of many religions, same as the Catholic or the Methodist Episcopal Church, they wrote to a lawyer. Can you tell us if any church or religion can be stopped? The Mide women had usually been associated with more traditional Ojibwe's who resisted conversion to Christianity, repeatedly attacked by the government, its defenders attempted to associate it more and more closely with Christianity, at least on the Red Lake Reservation, as their only hope of achieving recognition and protection as a legitimate religion. Um, on the other hand, it, as I looked for um, in the primary sources for native um, appeals to religious freedom. And I started asking the broader question, well, how did native people defend their traditions? I found they didn't always find this approach to be the most useful. Sometimes they found it more effective to defend their tribal dances in non-religious terms. They resisted charges of savagery, heathenism, and paganism by arguing that their dances were simply harmless social affairs, no different from recreational dances held in any white community. Officials could hardly object to Indians holding dances for the 4th of July, for example, especially since many white communities did the same. As time went on, Native people often found they had the most freedom to perform tribal dances in intertribal settings like fairs and exhibitions, powwows, where officials found it more difficult to accuse them of immorality, which was a frequent charge against Native ceremonies, or of preserving tribal savagery. Um, thus, the dynamics of government suppression pushed Indians, in some cases, to minimize the kind of spiritual ceremonial significance of their dances and to categorize them simply as dance, social dances, rather than trying to defend them as religion. So. Um, I argue in, in the chapter on um, Native Americans and religious freedom that Native struggles against government suppression in, this, in these, this early 20th century period partly remolded the traditions that they sought to protect. On the one hand, those practices that they defended as religion tended to take on characteristics that supported that designation in the eyes of the outside world. Meanwhile, the dances that they classified as social lost, at least to some extent, the attributes that were commonly marked as religious. And for that reason, are the, these dances um, are seen, to, are sometimes said to have become more secular, right? Um, but you know, my point here is not just that some dances became more religious and some became more secular, but that this kind, this distinction between religious and social or religious and secular dances was itself a product of government suppression. Um, and in that mix, right, what I call religious freedom talk shaped what Native people thought of as their religion. Um, I think, I, I want to propose that um, American religious freedom and the kind of cultural imperatives of religious freedom also worked in quite different ways to shape um, the Latter-day Saints and, and, and Mormon religion. 
Um, I don't have to tell anyone in this room that Mormons faced opposition, persecution, and mob violence from the very beginning of their history, or that Joseph Smith's early revelations on religious freedom became part of the Doctrine and Covenants, making them a central part of Mormon theology and practice from the start. Doctrine and Covenants repeat, repeatedly names the free exercise of religious belief and of conscience as part of God's plan, insists on the freedom of religion for religious societies as well as individuals, and denies the right of any state to deprive citizens of this privilege. More than almost any other church, with the possible exception of the Baptists, the Quakers, and Seventh-day Adventists, the saints saw religious freedom not just as a constitutional principle that could benefit them, but as a theological one fundamental to their faith. There's no doubt that the persecution they faced starting in the 1830s helped make that happen and shaped how this freedom worked in the church and in their lives. So as Professor Fluman's work has also shown, the early Mormons um, faced critics who didn't consider their church a legitimate religion. And in this, way, in, in this respect, they had something in common with Native people. Um, Governor Lilburn Boggs of Missouri, reporting to the Missouri State Legislature after the Mormon War in Missouri in 1838, and this has been the, I've been kind of digging into the primary sources in this material lately. Um, Governor Boggs called the church an infatuated and deluded sect. Their missionaries told tall tales of persecution in Missouri. Boggs said, which in every religious excitement that has marked the history of the earth has always been found the most effective weapon of conversion. Um, Governor Boggs' narrative drew on enlightenment skepticism about religious authority, and perhaps even more so on the fears of established churches about the dangers of dissenters and upstarts to the religious and social order. Genteel critics of early 19th century revivals, which often seem dangerously out of control, and it's that context out of which um, early Mormonism appeared. Um, these critics delegitimized revivals, not just Mormons, right, but like any kind of um, revivalist that were seen as excessive, out of control, um, by invoking a long history, starting with the notorious Anabaptist prophets of 16th century Munster. And there's the, like, where, that's, that's back when my Mennonite people were out of control and crazy. Um, <laughs> dangerously deluded visionaries, prophets, and enthusiasts. The discourse of fanaticism and delusion, in other words, was one way for established, safely moderate gate gatekeepers to police the boundaries of religious, religious legitimacy in American life. Some critics didn't think that Mormons were really motivated by religion at all. According to General Robert Wilson, who commanded troops that marched on Mormons in Davies County, Missouri, they were not a church, but a band of robbers. Governor Boggs claimed that they had violated the laws of the land by open and avowed resistance, had instituted among themselves a government of their own, independent of and in opposition to the government of the state. For him, Religion was properly distinct from the realms of politics and, and, and government. Religion, good religion, should stay safely in its lane. He hastened to assure the people of Missouri that his administration was fully committed to the principle of religious freedom. Quote, in recommending the publication of this testimony, I have no care about its effect upon the principles of that sect, the Mormons. Our constitution has given us the high privilege of religious independence and left the worship of the supreme to the unfettered will of every member of the community. Governor Boggs didn't object to anyone's religion, he insisted, but to the Mormons' violence and to their presumption in setting up a government of their own. This did not count as religion and couldn't claim protection as such. Anti-Mormons in Missouri also associated the Mormons with Native Americans and with the persistent dangers of violence on the western Missouri frontiers. One of them, um, Nathan Marsh, this is a petition to the governor, reported to Governor Boggs in September 1838 that the countryside was in a complete ferment due to constant reports about, quote, the hostile intentions of the Mormons and their allies as it's currently believed they've ingratiated themselves with the Indians to assist them in their diabolical career. Um, 
as Paul Reeve has recently argued, by associating Mormons with Indians and with other non-white racially suspect groups, these Missourians were already hinting that Mormons could no longer be considered fully or reliably white. More on that in a minute. In the same letter, Marsh described rumors of apocalyptic prophecies that allegedly circulated among the Mormons. They were taught to believe and expect that immense numbers of Indians of various tribes are only waiting the signal for a general rise, he claimed, when, as they stated, the flying or destroying angel will go through the land and work the destruction of all who are not Mormons. The Indians were to be the principal means for achieving this end. Their object, he concluded, is everything opposite to Christian feeling and principle. Here again, the prophetic fervor of the saints seemed out of control, threatening violence, aligning them even further with Indian hostility and violence. Now, whether or not the Mormons were circulating this rumored prophecy, they made other equally apocalyptic claims that exceeded any well-groomed or well-behaved mold for religion. Um, just yesterday here in Special Collections, reading in the Kirtland Council Minute Book from the 1830s, I noticed this revelation read to the council by Oliver Cowdery in 1837. After the elect is gathered out, destruction shall come on the inhabitants of the earth. All nations shall feel the wrath of God after they've been warned by the saints of the Most High. Um, now, you know, Cowdery doesn't specify when or how this is going to happen, but it's not surprising that some of their neighbors might have been alarmed. Um, the words hostile and diabolical, which Marsh used against Mormons, were more often used to describe native people who did not readily accept their own dispossession. Um, following statehood in 1820, Missouri had used coercive legal mechanisms along with more direct forms of violence to expel virtually all native people from what had been their land, and we can rightly call this a kind of ethnic cleansing in Missouri. But many Native Americans, including Osage people whose traditional land holdings included most of the state, refused to honor the new restrictions. Only a year before Marsh's report, um, in 1837, a group of white citizens in Barry County, southwestern Missouri, had petitioned Governor Boggs, same governor, for stronger military action against what they termed swarms of restless, imprudent, imprudent and predatory savages traveling through their community and hunting on their lands. Rather than recognizing that the land they considered theirs had been forcibly taken from these native people only a few years earlier, white settlers decried the supposedly inherent violence of the people they called savages. Indian wars were hardly a distant memory then. White settlers in western Missouri were still fighting them. The Mormons held a complex, doubled position in this picture. Like other white settlers, they moved to western Missouri because it was as yet thinly settled, right? So this is what I'm thinking about in the new book, how um, this kind of settler colonial context shapes even where people move, where they go, how their traditions develop. Um, the, on, the recent and ongoing expulsion of native people made land affordable and available for new settlers, including Mormons. Later, um, the saints moved even further west out here to Utah because they wanted a new place outside the reach of what was then when they started the move, but, uh, outside the United States, um, when they intended to shape in their own image. When Mormons and other settlers enthused about improving a new land or fretted about the dangers of an untamed wilderness, they were erasing the presence and very often the re very recent expulsion of Native people from that land. The Latter-day Saints acted as white American settlers, right? And at the very same time, other white settlers were challenging their racial and religious credentials as, um, as such, as Americans. Religious freedom was one of the legal and discursive tools in the Mormons' arsenal. In this um, in situation, one of the ways in which they fought to reclaim that status and position themselves as real, true Americans. Um, religious freedom provided a culturally and legally sanctioned way to defend their radically more expansive view of what religion was, right? But the need to defend against anti-Mormon critics 
um, exercised sometimes a kind of disciplinary po um, power. On one hand, it served as a way to defend Mormon distinctiveness. But I would propose that it eventually also helped moderate their radicalism in conformity to the larger society's notions of what counted as religion. Um, all along, Mormons used religious freedom talk to demonstrate their allegiance to the ideals of the US Constitution, even when they were resisting US authority. They were, in their own estimation, more Americans, better Americans than anyone else. In the process, um, I suspect that religious freedom talk also helped Mormons position themselves as white, even when a time, and even at a time when others wrote them out of whiteness. Um, Another, I'm going to pull in another comparative example from the book now to help clarify this point. Far beyond Mormon history, in fact, Mormon history is a little late to this game, um, historians of whiteness have shown how malleable and contested and non-linear the history of whiteness is, right? Who counts as white? This changes over time. Uh, many people who are now considered white, Jews from Eastern Europe, Irish, and Italian, Italians, to name a few, were not always so. The Jewishness or the Catholicism of many Southern and Eastern European immigrant groups helped also to define them as racially other, not fully white. Jewishness especially had always been defined in racial and national as much as religious terms. The early 20th century saw um, newly virulent and racialized forms of anti-Semitism, one dimension of the hardening lines of racial distinction all around the world at this time. American Jews much like Mormons, were ardently committed to the principle of religious freedom, and it helped them to defend distinctively Jewish practices, kosher foodways, Sabbath observances, and much more against the overwhelming cultural dominance of Christianity. But Jewish celebrations of this ideal also helped counter popular suspicions of Jewishness as a threatening form of difference. Um, religious freedom when Jews invoked religious freedom, it helped them make the case that they were equally at home alongside Christians in American democracy. Let me give just one example. Um, the work of American Jewish historian and US diplomat Oscar Strauss, who uh, served for a time as the, um, the diplomat to the Ottoman Empire. Um, he wrote a book, so Strauss wrote a book titled Religious Liberty in the United States in 1896, a bit of a precursor to mine, perhaps. Um, he named his son Roger Williams Strauss after the you know, Rhode Island's famous sort of pioneering advocate of religious liberty. And Strauss also claimed, he also wrote a biography of Roger Williams. And he, he wrote a book also called The Origin of the Republican Form of Government, um, in which he argued that the Hebrews had been the original source of the Republican system of government and its ideals of civil and religious liberty. So for Strauss, this history had everything to do with the political present. And he used, um, he used it to defend the rights of Jewish immigrants at a time when anti-immigrant sentiment was on the rise. So he wrote in, his, in the conclusion to his biography of Roger Williams, the so-called American policy which is invoked against immigrants from the old world is a libel upon the immortal fame of the patriarchs of our freedom. Let us take care that we do not, in the years of our prosperity, violate the universal principles of justice and liberty underlying our American institutions. Jewish appeals to religious freedom had the effect also of framing Jewish concerns and therefore Jewish identity in religious more than racial terms, right? If um, outsiders discriminated against Jews as a racial group, um, Jews wanted to define themselves in the public discourse, not as a distinct race or a nation primarily, but instead as a religious group this kind of difference was to be protected and even celebrated on the all-American grounds of religious freedom, then perhaps the lingering barriers to full Jewish participation in the cultural and civic life of the nation could finally be removed. Um, all of this, I argue in the book, helped ease the transition of Jews into the racial status of whiteness in the United States. 
um, the tri-faith movement of the mid 20th century, which took shape just before the Second World War as the Nazis were gain gaining power in Germany, um, staged programs designed to combat the urgent problems of anti-Semitism and anti-Catholicism in the United States, oriented around religious toleration and religious freedom. This movement helped to gradually redefine both Judaism and to some extent Catholicism as legitimate American religions and to position American Jews especially as religious rather than a racial minority in American life. And so by the 1950s, um, the three, the, you know, three American religions, Protestant, Catholic, Jew became the title of a, of a very well-known book um, talking about American religious pluralism. Um, I, I think we might be able to make a similar kind of argument in the Mormon case about kind of gaining public acceptance as a religion. Long before the fight over polygamy, religious freedom served as the Mormons' most important political and legal tactic for communal self-defense. But even when the saints were at their most defiant, um, their religious freedom talk placed them at the center of the American story, loyal to the highest American principles. While others condemned them as un-American or even anti-American, they saw themselves as the true Americans, the fulfillment of a providential design. Um, God's hand had guided the first English settlers. Um, and note there's also a kind of settler colonial narrative of manifest destiny here, embedded here. Um, God's hand had awarded the fledgling United States victory in its war for independence and inspired the US Constitution all to prepare the way for the restoration of God's true church and the Latter-day Saints. This was part of their defiance, um, but their religious freedom appeals um, also called them back at times to formulations of religious freedom that the dominant society would, affect, would accept and that could stand in some tension with the prophetic imperative to put all things under God's command. This balancing act was already um, evident in the Doctrines and Covenants. Um, section 102, verse 7 of the 1835 edition, and I was looking at the 1835 edition. I don't think it's the same in the current edition. Uh, <laughs> we believe that rulers, states, and governments have a right and are bound to enact laws for the protection of all citizens in the free exercise of their religious belief. But we do not believe that they have a right in justice to deprive, deprive citizens of this privilege or proscribe them in their opinions, so long as a regard and reverence is shown to the laws and such religious opinions do not justify sedition nor conspiracy. This is a, a revelation to Joseph Smith put down in, in, in the Doctrines and Covenants. At a time when Mormons were already being called seditious or even treasonous, um, Joseph Smith would be tried for treason in Missouri a few years later. This provided a clear statement that might help convince authorities that treason was not their intent um, it was a clarification at a time of like intense persecution that admitted limits to the authority of the church. It also placed the emphasis on religious belief and opinion rather than presenting a kind of forthright defense of religious practice or envisioning the church as a body um, with governing authority. The tone of defiance, um, religious freedom as a rationale for kind of communal self-defense is stronger elsewhere in the Doctrine and Covenant and much stronger um, in, as, as time moved forward. Um, for example, the, the famous um, SALT sermon given by Sidney Rigdon in far west Missouri as anti-Mormon violence escalated there. Here's Parley Pratt's description of that event. Quote, on the 4th of July, 1838, thousands assembled at far west they erected a liberty pole, hoisted the bald eagle with its stars and stripes. Under the colors of our country, we laid the cornerstone of a house of worship. Um, Rigdon's address, quote, claimed and determined our constitutional rights as American citizens and manifested a determination to do our utmost from that time forth to resist all oppression, to maintain our rights and freedoms according to the principles of liberty as guaranteed to every person by the constitution and laws of our government. This declaration was received with shouts of Hosanna to God and the Lamb and with many long cheers by the assembled thousands who were determined to yield their rights no more. 
So, uh, you know, Rigdon is talking about liberty writ large, but religious liberty in particular is clearly um, at the forefront of his concerns. Um, 40 years later, now I'm going to, like, jumping forward in time, Bishop Taylor's response to the 1879 um, law against polygamy struck the same defiant tone. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is composed of people who are chiefly citizens of the United States, he said. When they took the oath of allegiance to the Constitution and government of the United States, they made no promise of submission to any interference with their religious liberty. Neither did they agree that Congress or any court should decide what might or might not be considered a part of their religious faith. A law passed by Congress that, end quote, a law passed by Congress or a Supreme Court decision did not change what God had commanded. The saints followed a higher law, and they insisted that whatever federal authorities might say, the US Constitution rightly interpreted was on their side. So the principle of religious freedom gave them a tool for defiance, a way to claim righteousness under the Constitution as well as under God, even as they defied the authorities of the United States. But when the Latter-day Saints wanted or needed to strike a more accommodationist tone back in the early 1830s, and then again after the end of polygamy, religious freedom also helped them make that adjustment. Um, in the few minutes I have left, I want to use the two cases from my book that I mentioned at the beginning to suggest how this accommodation might have worked. Um, and Again, you know, I'm curious to hear your responses to, to this as I consider it a kind of experimental um, argument and one that I have not tried to elaborate or tried to research very exhaustively. Um, so first, the first case is the fight over the election of Brigham Roberts to the U.S. Congress. Anti-polygamy reformers had fought hard against statehood for Utah in 1896. Controversy erupted again in 1898 when a Utah district elected Roberts, a member of the First Council of the Seventy, who'd served time in prison for bigamy, to the House of Representatives. Anti-polygamy activists presented seven million signatures imploring Congress not to seat him. And after extensive debate, the House concurred. But judging by the petitions to Congress and the overwhelming House vote against him, most Americans felt that seating Roberts would mean accepting the Mormons and their practice of polygamy back into the fold. Now, these events happened to coincide with the US colonization of the Philippines after the Spanish-American War, which is how they entered into my book, um, and with another controversy over practices of slavery and polygamy among the predominantly Muslim Moro people of the southern Philippines. When General John C. Bates negotiated a treaty with the Sultan of Sulu, who was the most important Moro leader, um, the treaty granted the Moros self-government and so tacitly allowed both practices of slavery and polygamy to continue. Um, abolitionists and anti-polygamy reformers in the United States were appalled that a Republican administration, Mc President McKinley, um, Lincoln's own party, was allowing this to happen. And they proposed a new anti-polygamy amendment to the US Constitution to prevent it. Um, you get a flavor of this um, debate from a Washington Post editorial, quote, the inclusion of this picturesque barbarian with his harem, slaves, and despotic rule under the banner of freedom marks the utmost limit of the incongruous in our expansion of the home of the free. Um, the racial politics of this debate are clear in this quote, right? He, he, uh, the Sultan of Sulu is a, uh, is a barbarian. Um, and illuminate the pervasive racism on both sides of the debate over imperialism. Would taking such barbarians under US control enable benevolent Americans to civilize them, as suggested in Rudyard Kipling's poem, The White Man's Burden, which was written at the time? Um, or, uh, or would it only corrupt the United States? Anti-polygamy activists applied the same logic to Mormons. Um, one letter to the editor about um, Brigham Ro Roberts, about the controversy over seeding Brigham Roberts. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes in the whole book, so I had to include it. I couldn't resist. Um, 
so what this letter said that a self-respecting people would quote shudder, shudder with outraged indignation to think of the leprous buttocks of a polygamous monster befouling a seat in our national congressional halls. <laughs> the adherents of such abandoned heathenism must stand back and not profane our national councils. <coughs> um, so real religious freedom clearly, you know, although Roberts and his defenders were arguing it for his seating in part on religious freedom grounds, um, these critics would have nothing of that, right? Uh, this, the, the religion he professed was not real religion, and his seating uh, had nothing to do with that. Really, real religious freedom had no bearing on the Roberts case. Um, Roberts and his supporters mounted a spirited defense. They argued that barring him from Congress would impose an unconstitutional test, religious test for public office, um, violated his First Amendment right to the freedom of religion, and would deny the right of Utah's people to elect their own representative to Congress. Roberts um, and other Mormons discussing his case wanted nothing to do with the Moro comparison, um, with, the, with the comparison to the Sultan of Sulu and his barbarism and his harems, right? Um, they identified themselves as patriotic Americans and good family men, the polar opposite of the racialized images of harems and heathenism that anti-polygamy activists um, wielded against them. Um, in other words, they wanted to safely position themselves as all American and racially white. Um, Elder Clarence Gardiner, president of the New England Conference of the LDS Church at the time, and the New English, England Conference um, had only been formally organized a couple years before this, um, he told the Boston Daily Globe that Mormons had been divided on Roberts that polygamy had not entered into his campaign in Utah as far as um, Gardner knew, and that, quote, the church had nothing to do with his election since individual members acted on their own understanding of the political situation. Asked about his LDS faith, Gardner, Gardner emphasized the word of wisdom, explaining that the Latter-day Saints had a practical gospel that spoke to the needs of daily life. Um, Roberts was not seated, but Mormons were taking a more accommodationist stand toward um, the larger society. And Gardner's comments um, emphasizing a kind of separation between religion and politics and emphasizing the word of wisdom as a kind of um, you know, pr practical way to counter um, sinfulness and meet people's needs in, in daily life. This is, this is an example of the shift that um, lots of historians, right, of, of Mormonism have charted in this period. Um, and I, I'm interested in thinking about how um, sort of the politics of religious freedom enter into that shift. Uh, similar controversy flared again, um, more, maybe more famous controversy four years later when Utah elected Reed Smoot to the U.S. Senate. Um, Smoot was an apostle in the LDS Church, but had never been a polygamist. Um, and after three years of debate, the Senate finally dismissed the case against him and seated him, a decision that, as Kathleen Flake has argued, symbolized the Mormons' gradual movement into the American mainstream. The Mormons' consistent emphasis on religious freedom as a way to mark their sort of all-Americanness um, helped them make these moves, I think. My final example is shorter, I promise, and I'm just about done, but I think equally revealing. Not long after the conflicts over Roberts and Smoot, when Native Americans were making their own case for religious freedom, um, Native people occasionally found support from non-Indian neighbors, and some of them were Mormons. Um, for example, when Bannock and Shoshone Indians on the Fort Hall Reservation in Idaho resisted the forceful suppression of their half dance by a government agent, um, the, lo the agent, Evan Estep blamed Mormons for inciting them. Quote, this incident has stirred up considerable feeling and has developed several constitutional lawyers who are howling about religious liberty, Agent Estep wrote in July 1913 back to his superiors in Washington. A number of Mormons are just now great believers in religious liberty and assert that it's their intention to take the matter up with the department. Um, one of these is Thomas I. Richardson, who speaks the Indian language about as well as any white man in the country, 
and who has advised the Indians as to their rights. Now, Agent Estep was convinced that the religious freedom claims were specious. He wrote, in the opinions of those who are best qualified to know, this dance has no religious significance at all, except that given it by white people and a few Indians who are smart enough to want to use the religious aspect as a lever. Um, so despite Estep's patronizing tone and his assumption that the Indians relied on white agitators, Bannock and Shoshone people, in fact, were quite capable of, of advancing this case on their own. A decade earlier, the Shoshone chief, Jim Ballard, had written to Lakota leaders urging them to resume their own forms of worship despite opposition from government agents in the Dakotas. So he's advising other Native people to use a religious freedom argument. Um, and he's involved in writing these le letters, religious freedom appeals from Bannock and Shoshone people against Agent Estep's um, policies in 1913. Um, but it's revealing that local Mormons stepped in on their behalf, apparently seeing a parallel with their own history of campaigns for religious freedom. At first glance, it looks like they saw common cause with Native people as victims of government oppression, and there's certainly truth to this. Um, at the same time, much like the government agent, the Mormon Thomas Richardson seems to have put himself in the role of a white savior who could instruct and intervene for the Indians. Estep saw Richardson as annoying, but not fanatical or barbaric himself. He appears instead as a misguided white savior with a legal strategy to save the Indians. Um, Estep grouped the Mormon Richardson with other white residents who only wanted, who only quote, wanted to have something spectacular and barbaric in the vicinity to show to strangers and to go and see themselves. That's Estep's um, kind of cynical assessment of why white people might want native dances to continue. Um, there's no question here that Mormons, although identifiable as Mormon, um, were part of the fabric of the local white community in Idaho. In very different ways, all of the stories that I've told here illustrate the utility but also the limits of religious freedom for minor minority groups in American life. For Native Americans, religious freedom appeals have always been limited by US white Christian norms for what counted as religion, norms that were shaped by racism and by the forceful seizure of Indian lands and are still very much in effect today. For American Jews, um, religious freedom was a more effective way to fend off the overwhelming predominance and cultural power of Christianity in American life. Um, and I've argued that the emphasis on religious freedom and on Jews as a religious group also helped enable a larger transition away from the notion of Jews as a race. Um, I gave a kind of really summary version of that in this talk. So if you're interested in learning more, it's, uh, there's an extended discussion of this argument in the book. Um, and so became one of the factors enabling Jewish access to whiteness, however unstable and, uh, and contested in American life. Um, and I would, I, although I haven't talked about it today, the Christian-shaped box for what counts as religion um, also exerted some kind of dis disciplinary pressures on um, Judaism and on Jewish life. Uh, as for the Mormons, religious freedom supported a decades-long period of more or less successful defiance against US state and federal governments while still allowing Mormons to, to understand themselves and position themselves as fully American and whatever anti-Mormon pro propaganda might suggest as um, unequivocally white. I just barely touched on the 20th century story of Mormon religious freedom, um, but my guess is that it would look a lot like that of the Jews, a moderating focus on religious freedom that also worked to kind of shape the LDS church into the contours and towards the concerns that most other Americans recognized as religious. Um, freedom of religion is a hotly contested constitutional principle today and throughout our history, one that all sorts of people invoke, often on opposite sides of any given dispute, precisely because of its cultural status and its legal authority in American life. It's a malleable ideal that can be defined and has been defined in any number of ways, but it's worth our time to see how this freedom has historically been formed and limited by a kind of white Protestant model for what counts as religion 
and the disciplinary pressures and unintended consequences that have often accompanied even the most successful minority appeals in its name. Thanks for bearing with me through this long talk, and um, I welcome your thoughts and questions. We, we have about four or five minutes, so if you've got a question, we'll have you kind of state it um, nice and loud. Uh, you can restate if you want, uh, Professor Langer. Go ahead. Um, so I know you're not talking about contemporary concerns, but last week in the Supreme Court decision that Dominique Gray could not have an imam at his execution, Yeah. do you, I mean, do you see that as something different that's happening now? Or does the, those seem to be straight lines back to the early 20th century or late 19th century and defining religios religion as um, white Protestant? I so <laughs> yeah, uh, I see them as a, a connected histories, but not straight lines. Uh -huh. um, yeah, you know, there, there, there's a kind of structural privilege that is given to Christianity that is very clear in, in the case you're talking about. Um, and that is a theme that is pretty powerful over the course of U.S. history in different ways, right? But, but it's also been always contested. And sometimes... Um, people arguing for a broader vision or more inclusive vision of religious freedom have um, have been more in the forefront, have been. <laughs> so it's not a linear kind of story. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering if you're thinking about your, your broader next projects in terms of uh, the right to mobility a little bit. It seems like settler colonialism and religious freedom in terms of Mormon history are really tied to Uh, you know, I hadn't quite put it to myself in that way, but yes, <laughs> absolutely. I have been thinking about mobility and certainly um, um, settler colonial. I, but by the, when you started, you said it, you threw me because you said the next broader project, and I don't actually see the next project as broader. <laughs> um, it's different. It's a kind of different, uh, different, different scale and different scope. But to get back to the question. Um, yeah, you know, I, I am thinking about mobility, how people move and who can move. And so in that way, absolutely, um, these, things are, these things are linked and it's kind of a um, privilege status in a way. But it also, but mobility is also something that is sometimes forced as in Indian removals. And so I, I, I'm looking in my project, um, kind of, I started in the Great Lakes region, but so many of the people that I got interested in, both native and kind of some white missionaries, ended up moving west, and several of them ended up in this kind of like Missouri, Kansas borderlands area, and what do you know, the Mormons are there too. So, you know, <laughs> um, so, that, so that's kind of the geographical reach of the project, and it's because I was following people. And I've also been very much, I'm trying to think about how to integrate also water and rivers, because as I look at primary sources, I, I mean, I, at these materials, I notice how important waterways are to where people travel, how people communicate, um, you know, <laughs> who's in touch with who, who goes where, has everything, because in an age before railroads and even, you know, before canals, like, settlers are also using native waterways, right? Uh, and, I mean, they're, they're, of course, the, the waterways are <laughs> everybody's waterways, but um, they're like portage uh, route sites, paths that native people had used to get in between, to get from like the Great Lakes waterways to the Mississippi River water system. And that's how transportation happens. 
um, and communications happen. So yeah, you know, m mobility, waterways, all of these things, it may not immediately seem to have much to do with, um, with religion, but of course it does, because that's how religious people and religious movements travel too. And um, because you made me think of it, I can't help telling this little story. So I've been working most intensely so far on a Baptist missionary named Isaac McCoy, who in the 1820s and 1830s was a major advocate for Indian removal west, right? And uh, he was a missionary first in Indiana and Michigan. And then f when the Potawatomi people were removed um, west to um, western Missouri and then pushed west out of Missouri to Kansas, he followed them. And, you know, as it happens, he ended up near um, Independence, Missouri. And I've just, like this week, discovered him named in Mormon sources as part of an anti-Mormon mob. Um, <laughs> and I was like, whoa! <laughs> I knew he was writing anti-Mormon petitions because he's there when, in the 1830s, uh, when the Mormon, you know, kind of war happened. But I, I didn't know he was actually leading an anti-Mormon militia until this week. So that was all a uh, little aside, and we're probably out of time, but the, the vagaries of research is what happens. <laughs> Thanks for your attention. Uh, let me let me mark here too uh, the generosity of uh, Professor Wenger, who, you know, most book talks. Someone comes and talks about their book. Most people don't write a special book talk <laughs> incorporating <laughs> local interests. So this was this was quite a generous move on your part, Tisa. We're grateful for you being here. Everyone, a round of applause again for. Our